This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome to Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. Uh, we broadcast live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30 uh, in the beautiful downtown studio offices of Think Tech Hawaii in Honolulu, Hawaii, Pioneer Plaza. We're a show that focuses on success stories in Hawaii, both the companies and the individuals. Uh, there are a lot of challenges in Hawaii. There's a lot of challenges all over the country. Uh, but for some reason, some people seem to make it work here. Uh, and they do well and so we try to highlight those individuals and their stories uh, and hopefully pass some of those secrets along to the audience so that they don't have to make the same mistakes. Uh, today we have uh, a special show every quarter we try to have a little bit of a commentary talking about some of the current news items and how it might have an impact on business in Hawaii uh, possibly across the country uh, and today we have two guests uh, I've got Daylin Yanagida who is very active in the HR industry here with Vantaggio. Uh, and then we have Ray Suchiyama, who has uh, lived in Hawaii almost, I think, maybe even longer than I have, uh, and has had the opportunity to see Hawaii grow and develop and, and pretty much transform itself over the years. So we've got some very good, interesting perspectives this, year, this uh, show. And, and we're going to kick it off with a topic that's been in the news the last few days uh, and ask uh, our guests and have a little discussion about North Korea and how does what's going on with North Korea and all the saber rattling that's going on is there going to be any impact to Hawaii with all of this noise? Ray, why don't you lead off? Well, the North Korean crisis is not only a um, national, international uh, kind of uh, uh, case here, uh, but also a local one, because it affects travel, and uh, and travel is where um, it's it's uh, it's all about in Hawaii because of tourism, and I think the hotel industry has to be very careful, kind of monitoring the situation, and uh, because people in the Midwest or throughout the U.S. and Japan uh, worry about the threat to Guam, and they think that Guam is close by Hawaii. Uh, that you know, it may uh, there may be some uh, kind of um, uh, retaliatory action, some kind of event that happens in Hawaii. So even within the hotel industry and business in general, um, I think there's also uh, this is a uh, wake up time to look at um, really to review disaster management, also to um, look at records, uh, how uh, redundancy and uh, record keeping, and even evacuation of key people uh, to other parts. So there's a lot of things to go go into, but yet I think the uh, business uh, in general in, in Hawaii would rather not this really uh, increase in, um, in, in, in uh, I guess, in severity because it will affect tourism. Yeah, there's certainly that possibility. Now, Daylin, from a, a small business perspective, I mean, you know, I go shopping all the time, you go shopping all the time, just the general business uh, of living in Hawaii. Do you see any impact from this North Korea situation? I think that, you know, as citizens of Hawaii, we're very um, tuned in to the activities of anything that, you know, occurs with regard to Asian and, and how it um, affects our Asia markets, especially with the impact on, on tourism. But um, I think that people are still sitting back to see what the reaction should be. Right, to kind of see how it plays out. Mm -hmm. I know we've gotten some information uh, to us from various sources about you know some of the missile defense capabilities that we have in in Guam uh, that we've got a number of ships uh, in the area that Japan has some ships mm -hmm. uh, and of course South Korea has got a, a lot of missile defense capabilities there so mm -hmm. whatever North Korea can come up with there's probably multiple layers that's going to stop anything making it this far so I think you're right I think there's been a uh, an awareness but not overly concerned at this point. Um, however, it can escalate and, and I, I hope that people can have a, a calm head about themselves and stop some of the sa saber rattling because I'm not sure that that helps very much. Um, you know, I am also a little bit concerned about, you know, the, not concerned so much, but maybe even the positive 
um, results of China and Russia actually um, not being very vocal about this. You know, they're already be supporting some of the, the economic sanctions that we've imposed, or the UN, I should say, mm -hmm. imposed, uh, with the agreement of Russia and China. Uh, and now with this war of words going on, um, I'm kind of encouraged a little bit that China and Russia are staying out of it to some degree. Well, um, China and Russia both want to see stability on the Korean Peninsula. That's number one. Uh, Vladivostok, a major seaport in, uh, of Russia, is barely 100 miles from the North Korean border. And, uh, of course, the Yalu River is the border with, uh, with China. Now, North Korea, though, is a fiercely independent country uh, and, and uh, kind of sustained itself after the Korean War, and which was uh, a devastating one back in 1953. There is no peace treaty between North Korea and, and the rest of and the U.S. and South Korea, but they want to really uh, be seen as a player in in the in the global um, you know, landscape. So we have to see what happens. But again, again, you're right that China and Russia are very close to what whatever happens in North Korea. That's right. Well, and Japan is too, and there's there's a lot of interest, very high levels of interest, watching this very closely. And so I think there's probably at this point a lot of things going on behind the scenes that we're not really privy to. Yeah, so let's hope that this pass, that there's no bloodshed, um, but I think in some ways, from my perspective, former military guy, I think we're just kicking the can down the road. At some point, something's going to have to be done. So uh, next topic, maybe a little less controversial. <laughs> um, last week we had a, a very interesting topic. Uh, we were supposed to talk about taxes and some of the different things that were going to be coming up and maybe the special uh, legislation or maybe even nationally uh, in tax reform. Um, but Tom Yamachika and I got a little bit tied up on the uh, taxes as it related to heart and the rail. Um, and we talked a little bit about the issuance of the bonds that's going to be done, uh, which causes some concern, but Ray, you had a, a perspective on that. Can you share right, that? Right, because uh, uh, of all the mechanisms, there are several mechanisms to raise more money, and it's called taxes, uh, and, and one uh, dealing with the GET, other with the uh, TAD, the hotel tax. So it goes, and, and of course, the uh, uh, widely not seen uh, option of the property tax, uh, that uh, they don't want to go uh, to that level. But again, if you, there's also the possibility of bonds. And, um, and I, everybody thought that it's easy to do bonds. You just go out and, and raise money to sell bonds. But as uh, Tom Yamachika pointed out, it's not that easy just because uh, you're in the bond um, uh, arena. You know, working with the SEC, they want to see a lot more transparency in compliance to rules, regulations, finances, and so forth. So it, it is not as easy as people thought, the, uh, according to Tom. Well, and I've worked for public companies in the past, and I have been an auditor, and I've audited public companies. And I know a lot of the disclosures uh, are pretty comprehensive. Um, there's always going to be secrets, but the, the intent is to disclose anything that could have an impact on the financial statements. And I'm, I'm afraid that we haven't been that open and transparent so far with what's going on over there. So I think there's a, a lot of surprises that people are going to learn. Um, what do you think about uh, the, and, and I know you've lived in places that had very sophisticated public transportation. Um, you know, i.e. Japan, and you visited other places. Um, you know, what do you think about uh, the tr mass transit in Hawaii? Is Are we ever going to be able to have something comparable to, say, Japan or Singapore uh, in Hawaii, or is our demographic or geographic too much different? Uh, it's a very complex question because um, in Japan or many other parts, uh, parts of the world, uh, you brought up mass transit to areas that really didn't have development. And then you had development mm -hmm. and that uh, kind of aligned with mass transit so that you bought a place because it was near a station. That was the key and got you to where you worked or shopped and so forth and came back. And that was, uh, so the same company that uh, built the railroads or subways 
owned and developed areas around it for shopping malls, condominiums, and housing, and so forth. It was a complete deal. And this is something quite separate uh, uh, happening here. And um, if you look back in time, it's not a it's not a uh, recent phenomenon. We had tr trolleys and trams all over Honolulu until the post-war era. And they went up uh, Wailai Avenue, they went by the Elks Club, there were trolleys that went to uh, the edge of Fort Shafter. So there was an extensive trolley system, and uh, also up in Ma Manoa and Nuano, but those are ways to sell lots in that time, during the 20s and 30s, uh, to be part of the uh, development of Honolulu. Again, uh, you're coming to an area uh, of, of really uh, uh, of, of a big question. Is it about rail or is it about transit? You see, <laughs> that is a larger question. And how do you plan a city uh, with a transit system or options? And because sometimes uh, in, in among transit experts, they, said, they say that if a city can't get bike lanes right, how can they get a huge... <laughs> Mass transit line, correct. Well, but we're also trying to um, pass laws and, and regulations uh, for pedestrians. Apparently, right. we right. still can't get that right either. So there's, you know, and I'm being sarcastic, but, you know, we seem to have an awful lot of rules and regulations, and a lot of things are being forced down our throat whether we want them or not. And I think because we've already got a lot of this development in place and it's already there, we're, we're trying to connect um, some of these places, but is it the most economical and efficient way to do it? You know, I mean, we had one of the best bus systems in the entire country. Oh, you were involved with the bus, still I, I yeah, was yeah, on yeah, the right, board of the right. bus, uh, you know, but I didn't have anything to do with winning those awards. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we did, uh, and I was aware of it, and I watched, and we had some very sophisticated management, we had good ridership, uh, it, it was a well-oiled machine, and we won a lot of awards for that. Um, we. I wish we could have spent more time looking at what we were doing successfully uh, and see if we could enhance that or complement that and whether that included a, a, a ground rail or raised rail or some combination of you know, supplemental routes. Um, you know, I just, I'm not sure that we went through the, the proper exercise to do that. And so now we're gonna be stuck with this thing. Now, you and I both live on the east side. Mm -hmm. When they build this, whether it goes to Middle Street or even if it goes to Alamoana, how much benefit do you anticipate getting out of this when your commute is from uh, east side into town? Zero. Zero, but yet you're paying your right. fair share for it. I think it. that, you know, that there's always going to be questions about, okay, when, when we see rail done, what, what will happen to the increase in taxes that we were um, given and are we going to use that to pay off the, the debt, the deficit in it, um, and what, what's really going to happen? Well, I think experience will kind of lead us to the answer. You know, once taxes go up, it's really hard to bring them back down again. And once the rail is up and running, but you know, wherever that route terminates, uh, there's going to be a deficit that's going to have mm -hmm. to be funded. Mm -hmm. and there's going to be bonds that have to be repaid. That money's got to come from somewhere. Uh, when we come back from break, uh, we need to take about 60 minutes. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about another topic um, that uh, may also lead to maybe some new opportunity in Hawaii. Uh, and so we're going to take that 60-minute break. Uh, please stay tuned. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. <laughs> Planning all week for the day of the big game. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. What on the list is who's gonna drive? It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose a DT. Captain of our team. It's the DT. For every game day, assign a designated driver. Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. 
I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. Aloha and welcome back to Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. Uh, we're here today talking with, with two individuals that have been on the show before, uh, De Lin Yamagita and Ray Suchiyama. Both of them bring some very interesting and broad experience uh, to the table and we're talking about various uh, commentary type items uh, this week. Uh, our next one is going to be medical tourism. Now, I know, Ray, you've been looking at this a little bit. I know I was involved with it uh, when I was uh, you know, at HMAA. Um, and, Dylan, it'll be interesting as a, a layperson, maybe, uh, to get your perspective on this conversation. So, Ray, what is it that interests you about medical tourism? Well, to me, uh, medical tourism, and to be uh, very simple uh, to define it, is that uh, you can combine a medical procedure or treatment with a vacation uh, for yourself and your family or friends and so forth. And uh, usually uh, in real life, it means people from uh, advanced countries going to another country to get a treatment for, uh, for much cheaper in their home country. And those countries may be in Thailand, Singapore, uh, even uh, for people uh, from uh, some places like uh, Europe to go to, even to the U.S. Uh, or uh, China and the uh, Middle East. And my, my whole interest is that, is that medical tourism for a resort-like place like Hawaii could actually increase the level of medical treatment for the community. And that's what I'm trying to kind of focus at. But in order to do that, you have to create an infrastructural ecosystem of combining services, just like a concierge at a major hotel, a resort, plus very good high quality treatment and procedures with equipment and medical doctors and nurses all in one place. And that could really increase uh, flows of wealthy individuals from emerging uh, countries like China and other places to come to Hawaii and, and uh, pay into increasing and, and developing medical care for the entire community. And what's really fascinating about this is that a lot of these procedures are being paid for not through medical insurance where rates are negotiated, but through cash payments. Right. And so for the facilities and the providers that are performing the services, um, they get full pop, right. you know, which could be very attractive to some, some businesses. Uh, you know, the, and, and before people discount this too quickly, I think it's interesting to note that in Thailand, uh, they've got some of the most advanced medical facilities and some of the best trained physicians who, as a general rule, uh, get their training in medical schools uh, from either France or from the U.S. And the hospitals are all brand new. They've got the best equipment, the best facilities. They're, they're operated by some of the best technicians uh, right out of training. Um, and they're built you know, seamlessly with some of the resort type of facilities and the hotels that allow for a better uh, recovery period. So it's, it's popular, it's being done. Uh, it's being done by, you know, in various places in the world. Uh, and we might have an opportunity to explore here. Ray, what type of um, medical procedures are we talking about? Well, it's a, a full range. Uh, they can have microsurgery sometimes or plastic surgery. Um, some uh, procedures uh, that are elective, like uh, Red said, in the U.S. that uh, uh, health insurance don't cover. And uh, they would uh, go, go about uh, seeking those kinds of uh, procedures or operations. Another area that's quite uh, big, especially for Japanese, is called Ningen Doku, which means a complete physical, in many, many, uh, you know, complete MRI, full body complete, scan, a full yeah. body scan, uh, uncover any, um, you know, early evidence of, of tumors or, or uh, any type of cancers or anything like that. And it's a two, three day, uh, uh, you know, program. And they uh, uh, have a lot of uh, tests and, and uh, measure all kinds of uh, uh, you know, uh, impact on, on, on your body from, you know, uh, from uh, either from age or, or you take you know, uh, procedures. So I think that's, that's also an area where it's preventive. 
it's preventive. It's not a procedure, but you go in and say, check me out. And then you have a vacation after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th so yeah. Y there's various types. So are these, are these services primarily from private um, physicians' offices or centers, or are we talking about um, our larger hospitals? They're larger hospitals, and uh, they're in uh, uh, like a St. Raffles Hospital in Singapore, which is quite famous, Bumuragad in Bangkok. They're also in uh, Seattle, Virginia Mason, uh, the Mayo Clinic in you know, Minnesota, Minnesota, world famous, uh, that attracts a lot of people from Europe, Europe and the Middle East uh, to that center in the middle of uh, the U.S. So it, it is, it is uh, also, uh, again, um, uh, a, a full kind of um, uh, intensive, uh, from intensive care to preventive, to all kinds of areas. So uh, again, it, it, is, it is a uh, world where what Raj, Raj said, when families come, uh, they, act, they buy things, they go uh, hotels, cars, uh, duty-free restaurants, so they add to the economy also. And that's where the tourism piece right. comes in. But mm -hmm. you know, in addition to just doing the basic procedure, you know, the recovery facilities mm -hmm. are much nicer. They, mm -hmm. they're, they're suites like in very, you know, four and five star type hotels. Mm. Um, they've got maids, they've got uh, skilled uh, nursing mm. uh, professionals there to help you, you know, go through the recovery. Um, and, you know, the, the cost of labor is, is much less in some of these places. And so it, you get a lot higher level of service for a lot less price, um, which makes the, the, the procedure and the recovery uh, be a better experience. So if there is a climate in Hawaii for um, medical tourism, how would that impact services to, say, myself as a resident? If, we're, if we shift to um, looking at a, a tourist experience, if you will, right, because we're talking about packaging, um, how would that impact services to me as a citizen? Oh, I think it, it, uh, you will see better equipment. You will see better doctors. You will see better nurses. More uh, doctors. Yeah, more doctors and facilities. And by people paying you know, cash and so forth, it offsets uh, you know, uh, people who are uh, on lower incomes or, or uh, Medicaid and other patients. So uh, that is a boon for the community, I feel, uh, that, uh, uh, that hospitals get upgraded, kind of, uh, and doctors and nurses also. So I, I don't think, again, if you have one person who uh, pays all in cash, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, uh, again, that that's a, a good uh, you know uh, uptake to to a hospital uh, finances. Well, and another you know, re remember that there's economies of scale and scaling going on with this. So that if there are these medical tourism patients coming in, it may take these facilities seventy percent of their capabilities. You know, they may be operating at seventy percent of capacity. Uh, there's a thirty percent piece that they need to do something with. So there could be some very high-end facilities with very skilled professionals that would be able to make some of these facilities and these procedures available to the local community at maybe a reduced rate to use up that unused capacity. Well, Reg, you have a vast experience in, in the healthcare industry from HMAA. So what as, as a consumer of medical services in Hawaii, should I be concerned that now my physician is going to choose to move into that realm because they have more opportunity to, to make real you know, money? I guess there's always going to be some possibility of that, but a lot of the procedures that are being done are elective procedures. Um, and these are not normally going to be covered by insurance anyway, so it's going to have to be the, the, the patients that are able to pay cash for these. Um, you know, will some physicians possibly trans? They might, but they've got their own patient base already. They've already got the relationships. They've got their business right there. And this model is different from what's currently existing. So I think what you might see is new physicians coming into the market or coming out of the school going over there and doing this. Um, which doesn't address our physician shortage, but if there's an opportunity in Hawaii for physicians to make a lot more than they might be making on the mainland, I have a feeling we'll see people moving over here to be able to fill those positions. And overall, we're gonna see a higher level of physicians in the marketplace. 
So we know that the tourists would definitely be attracted to Hawaii and it, what it offers as a vacation destination anyway. So if you were to layer on, um, you know, elective medical procedures, it could be, you know, uh, something of interest for them. But what about the, the physicians, the medical community in Hawaii? Are they open to that? Well, I, think, I think they're very open to it. Uh, it's just that I don't think they've experienced uh, what benefits medical tourism can bring to the hospitals. But you have a very interesting question. Uh, it's not a, uh, medical tourism has uh, several parts to it in that uh, hospitals just uh, do not think of themselves as branding or marketing agents <laughs> uh, globally. Uh, so they have to tie up with uh, companies with expertise in those markets, number one, mm -hmm. to attract those people to come in. And they really have to do an audit of, of all the things necessary to keep that person uh, uh, in a comfortable, uh, culturally aware, language aware, uh, sensitive uh, kind of experience. When they check in, is there a person who speaks their language? Uh, nurses also, how about their entertainment uh, on the TV? Is it in their language? How about food? Uh, you know, are there halal food or special Chinese food for breakfast? You see all those questions. So there are opportunities for people in the community to become consultants, to become interpreters, to uh, be part of the uh, ecosystem to provide buy condos, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, drivers and guides. There's all kinds of uh, so opportunities lot of that increase. Opportunity for right. a lot of different uh, mm -hmm. elements to come together right. to help support this new industry. Uh, now, we've only got about 30 seconds left, and we're going to have to wrap up. But I, I think this is certainly a, an industry worth exploring. It's, it's got some potential. It's a clean industry. You know, it could help this, you know, the, our community, our Ohana all by itself. So it, there's a lot of reason to take a closer look at that. There's hurdles. There are things that we're going to have to address. Oh, yeah. um, but, you know, let's, uh, let's take a look at it and see if we can start on a small scale and grow big. All right, this is Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. Today was our quarterly commentary. We, we covered some interesting topics all the way from North Korea to medical tourism. <laughs> so we've, uh, matter of fact, maybe the conflict in North Korea might trigger a need for some medical <laughs> tourism. <laughs> Uh, but we broadcast live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30. Um, we highlight successful individuals and businesses. Uh, hopefully you've learned something from today's show, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Aloha.